Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Aaron Viner. In our top story, the Palestinian Authority may end its relationship with the United States. Palestinian leaders accused the White House of extortion and threatened to cut ties entirely after U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson warned the PA that their diplomatic mission in Washington is in serious jeopardy. Tillerson refused to certify the Palestinians' compliance of a congressional mandate after PA President Mahmoud Abbas reached out to the International Criminal Court at The Hague seeking to prosecute Israeli citizens. The PA boss is well aware that his action is in violation of the congressional mandate and therefore could result in penalties if the PA pursues the matter at the ICC. President Trump has 90 days to review the decision and can reverse the law if he finds that the Palestinians are conducting direct and meaningful negotiations with Israel. Speculations surrounding President Trump's plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians is running rampant and has prompted Jerusalem to restate its red lines. Israel is naturally concerned for its security in any future agreement, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu recently addressed this issue at a gathering of senior cabinet ministers. He said that the only consideration that will guide me will be Israel's national and security interests. The Hamas terrorist organization, which has sworn to act toward Israel's destruction, is in negotiations with the PA to form a unity government. And Netanyahu reiterated that Israel cannot negotiate with the Palestinians if Hamas is part of that alliance. The Palestinian Authority has been found liable for civil wrongful death damages in the murder of three Israelis in a terrorist attack. The 2001 highway shooting left two little girls orphaned and a family devastated. The Jerusalem District Court ruled that the Palestinian Authority and the terrorists responsible for the attack must pay $17.6 million in compensation to the surviving family members. It stated that the PA was responsible for soliciting and aiding the terrorist group which perpetrated the heinous crime. Two Israelis were seriously hurt in a terrorist attack last week. 70-year-old David Ramati was hospitalized with a head wound and two broken vertebrae after a Palestinian terrorist attempted to run him over. The terrorist then exited the vehicle and attempted to stab several soldiers before he was neutralized. Ramati, a former U.S. Marine, was released from the hospital last week and is expected to make a slow but full recovery. The other man injured in the attack continues to fight for his life. 35-year-old father of five, Evan Azar Hollering, suffered a serious brain injury and was still sedated and breathing with the help of a ventilator at the time of this broadcast. His wife is asking the public to pray for his complete recovery. Several hundred Orthodox Jews were given permission to pray at the graveside of the prophets Nathan and Gad for the first time in 18 years. Heavily guarded by the IDF, the group of about 300 traveled deep into territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority where the prophets are buried. Today, a mosque sits on top of the tombs of the Jewish prophets, so the group did not enter the Muslim building. Instead, they held prayers outside the structure. Even so, they were attacked by Palestinians who threw rocks and firebombs. The army intervened to prevent a further escalation of violence, and the Jews were allowed to complete their prayers and leave peacefully. The U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee has unanimously approved the Taylor Force Act. Named for an American Army veteran who was brutally murdered by a Palestinian terrorist in Israel, this law will penalize the Palestinian Authority for funding terrorism by halting its U.S. aid. Family members of terrorists receive a healthy monthly stipend from the PA, and many American lawmakers say that U.S. aid is indirectly funding Palestinian terrorism, and therefore must be cut as long as the PA keeps murderers and their families on the payroll. The committee also passed two other resolutions aimed at cutting the financing of terror. The Palestinian International Terrorism Support Prevention Act calls to sanction foreign governments and organizations which support terror, and the Hamas Human Shields Prevention Act would similarly sanction any government, group, or individual providing financial or material support to Hamas. Israel offered humanitarian aid to Iran and Iraq following a deadly earthquake in the region that killed hundreds of people. Despite Iran's constant threats to wipe the Jewish state off the map, Jerusalem did not hesitate to make available support after the devastating 7.5 magnitude tremor struck the area. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, our quarrel is not with the people of Iran, but with the tyrannical regime that holds them hostage and threatens Israel's destruction. The offer, however, was immediately rejected, which Netanyahu said shows the true face of the hardline Islamic Republic. The new Museum of the Bible has opened on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. This $500 million state-of-the-art museum displays the history of the Bible and credits the Jews with carefully preserving the most important book ever written. The museum's curators place special emphasis on the Jewish origins of the Bible, and Jews and Judaism are celebrated as the forefathers of Christianity. The museum is said to be an amazing modern and interactive experience, which is meant to inspire its visitors to reread and appreciate the Bible. Jerusalem's Bible Lands Museum consulted on this amazing project, and there is even an exhibit contributed by Israel's Antiquities Authority. The museum was gifted to the National Mall by the founders of Hobby Lobby. Thousands of Ethiopian Jews gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Sigd. Busloads of faithful came from all over the country to take part in the festival, which is held exactly 50 days after Yom Kippur. Sigd literally means prostration, and the holiday is observed by fasting, praying, and reading psalms on a hilltop overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. Sigd is the celebration of the covenant between God and the people of Israel, but it also represents the Ethiopian community's quest to return to the holy city of Jerusalem. The holiday concludes with a collective pilgrimage to the Western Wall, where thousands of Ethiopian Jews simultaneously thank God for the Torah and for returning them to their ancient homeland. Members of two lost tribes of the House of Israel have finally come home. After thousands of years of exile, 231 immigrants from the lost tribes of Menashe and Dan returned to their homeland last week. 162 members of the Bene Menashe, or the Sons of Manasseh, who were driven from the land by the Assyrian Empire more than 27 centuries ago, arrived from northeastern India. They were joined by 69 Ethiopian Jews who immigrated from Africa. The new immigrants will be placed in absorption centers where they will be given intensive training in the Hebrew language and prepared to assimilate into Israeli society. Christians and Jews recognized the return of these lost tribes from the biblical prophecy of the ingathering of the exiles and the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy, which says, I will gather you from the lands where you are scattered and you will know that I am the Lord. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in a beautiful sunny day in Jerusalem on our rooftop studio. My guest today is Arla Wattenstein. Arla is the director of Brothers for Life. Arla, thank you for being on the show. Hi, Josh. Tell our viewers a little bit about what is Brothers for Life. So Brothers for Life is an organization that was created and run by wooden Israeli soldiers in order to help their fellow, their fellow brothers who are stuck reclaim their lives. You know, uh, I served in the military and there's the bond of band of brothers. Uh, are you seeing a lot of people stand up and say, you know, this is my wounded comrade, I want to get involved? It's, it's, it's more than that. People say that uh, when they get into the center we have just outside of Ben Gurion Airport, they don't, they don't need to speak with words, they can speak with eyes. Sometimes, sometimes the special bond they have between them is a bond that uh, speechless. People literally get bond and get connected to other people in a very short time. So what are some of the activities that uh, Brothers for Life uh, takes part in? So Brother for, Brothers for Life is an organization that was created from the bottom up, which means we take over this, any, sol any need that the soldiers might have from A to Z, from financially, medically, legally, uh, food coupons for the high holidays, and anything, anything they might need. In Israel, everyone serves in the military, and it's a great respect for our military uh, uh, personnel, the soldiers themselves. Are you seeing this uh, as a lot of Israelis getting involved in this, or is this mostly people from abroad helping Israeli soldiers? So when we first created the organization, most of the supporters, most of the people were from overseas, abroad. And lately, lately, in the last two and a half years, we can see more and more Israelis that are touched by what we are doing 
and understand that uh, although all the Israelis served, uh, what we did and what happened to us was not for nothing. This is something that doesn't come up a lot. People talk about the wars we have, the conflicts, the intifadas. How many, how many uh, injured soldiers are we talking about that, that are around today that are still working in society? So, we, so the Brothers for Life is taking care of only the soldiers who were injured while protecting the state of Israel. So the numbers, the numbers that we are taking care of at the moment are closer to 800 soldiers between the ages of 20 and 42 years old. So besides that group of soldiers, we are talking about, I would say, about 1,000 more soldiers that out there that we need to find them. And, and these soldiers, you know, what, what are the, the basic needs that they need? What is the most compelling thing that they need for, to help right now? So the basic need for a wounded soldier today in Israel, and not just in Israel, is just a hug. It's to see someone and see that he's suffering and needs our help, and we are now going to give you a hug. We're going to ask how are you, we're going to touch your arm, we're going to ask you what do you need. And most of the time it will end by that. That's it. You need always someone that will ask you and that will be care about who you are, what happened to you, and what I can do for you. What's interesting about Brothers for Life is it actually was founded by wounded soldiers for wounded soldiers. How important was that aspect of the founding of it? The aspect that the wounded soldiers themselves will create the organization, it's something that uh, only someone who were there in your cube, in exactly your position, can help you. So if someone lost a leg, no matter how big and, su and success a psychologist you are, you will never be able to stand by him and tell you everything is going to be just fine. You need someone who lost his leg and will come to him and will tell him, you see, I lost my leg and everything is going to be just fine. When you hear it from a person like that, that's going to be easier for you to trust. Uh, one of the things that we focused on on this show is lone soldiers. Are, are lone soldiers involved in this process? Because they're here without family, and if they get wounded, who helps them? So, so the, that's a good question. So for us, for us, uh, it doesn't, we, we don't care if you have a family or not, because we're going to be on your family. So if it's a soldier with 10 brothers and sisters or the soldiers with family from Argentina, we're going to help you and we're going to be there for you. I understand that people from abroad have really heard this cry and are getting involved now in America, uh, in Europe. Why do you think people who don't live in Israel would care about this phenomenon? So I, I think what's, what's so special about it is that uh, people understand that the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, is not just about Israel. It's about people no matter where they are. And I think uh, through the organization, through the soldiers, we were able to bring Israel, the small state of Israel, to other people's homes, no matter where they live, South Africa, Europe, Asia, and North America. What's the future for Brothers uh, for, for Life? What, what's going to happen in the next five years? If you ask me, the personal view for Brothers for Life is that we're going to shut, the, shut, the, shut down the, the offices and the center, and we're going to back, go back to our uh, normal, normal life. If we, will no, if we will not have any more wounded soldiers, I'm happy. That's our main goal. But until that day will happen, we will be there for any wounded soldier who are suffering and needs our help. Arla, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Yeah, I will tell you two things. First of all, keep doing what you do the best, which is to be the best ambassadors for Israel. You see me, I served in the IDF, and I'm, I'm a normal guy. I have a family, four kids, I'm happy. And we want you to keep serve the goal, be ambassador for Israel and the IDF. The second is, we need, we need support to continue what we do to help the wounded soldiers. So you can go online, www.brothersforlife.com and help us. Thank you. Arla, thanks for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. I'm Eliezer Moody Sandberg world chairman of Keren Sod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. 
Through the work of Keren Esod, we believe that in the next five years, there will be more Jews in the state of Israel than all the Jews outside of Israel combined. Join us on this historic mission. In just a few short years from now, for the first time since the destruction of the Second Temple, more Jews will once again be living in Israel than in the rest of the world combined. This incredible milestone is a testament to the truth of God's prophecy, the determination of the Jewish people, and the hard work of Karen Hayasod, which for the past 90 years has dedicated itself to returning the Jewish people home. After the Roman army ransacked Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Jewish nation was scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. But each generation kept faith and dreamed of returning to their ancient home. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. Over the centuries, a tiny remnant of Jews constantly remained. By 1800, just 24,000 lived in their homeland, while untold millions built Jewish lives across the globe. Throughout the following two centuries, the ingathering of the Jewish people gradually became reality. In the land of Abraham and of King David's ancient kingdom, the Jewish people finally fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy. There is hope for your future. Your children will return to their borders. The first wave of Jews arrived in the late 19th century, mainly from Russia and Yemen, pioneering some of modern Israel's most familiar cities. Soon before the First World War, they were joined by Jews fleeing the pogroms of Tsarist Russia. They founded the very first kibbutz, and revived the ancient biblical language as modern Hebrew. During the 1920s, as Europe was reshaped in the aftermath of war, Jews continued to find refuge in the Holy Land, fleeing from growing anti-Semitism. Crucial to these efforts was the work of Karen Hayasud supporters, who had galvanized Jewish communities and their friends across the world in an effort to see Jews return home. This was critical in helping hundreds of thousands of Jews escape the dark clouds of Europe as the horrors of Nazi Germany became a reality. By the outbreak of World War II, the Jewish population of Israel had swelled to a quarter of a million. This number swiftly grew during the late 1940s as the survivors of humanity's darkest hour headed to the only place they could call home. As the world reeled from the shock of Nazism, Jews were forced to flee persecution once more, this time from the Middle East and North Africa, with around 900,000 Jews expelled or forcibly removed from Arab countries between 1948 and 1970. They arrived destitute in the fledgling state of Israel, eventually playing a major role in its development. Israel has continued determinedly to rescue Jews from danger. Tens of thousands of Ethiopian Jews were airlifted to safety in the 1980s and early 1990s. In the following years, as the Soviet Union collapsed, almost one million Jews made the journey to Israel. With the help of Karen Hayasad supporters, they have made new lives in the land of their forefathers. Two millennia after the Roman destruction, we believe more Jews will soon once again be living in Israel than outside of Israel. They will be living in a thriving, independent Jewish state. Finally, as Zechariah predicted, old men and women will sit in the streets of Jerusalem filled with boys and girls playing. Join us in making this dream a reality. Bible-believing Christians around the world have a role to play in the fulfillment of this biblical prophecy. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their arms, 
and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, call us at 1-800-505-1665 or visit our website at www.khisrael.org. My heart sank when I saw pictures from this great earthquake on the Iranian-Iraqi border. I saw mothers and fathers searching for their children, children buried under the rubble from this horrible earthquake. As a father, as an Israeli, as a Jew, I wanted to help. That's why yesterday I instructed that Israel offer medical aid via the Red Cross to victims of this disaster. Israel has no quarrel with the people of Iran. We never have. Our only quarrel is with the cruel Iranian regime, a regime that holds its people hostage, a regime that threatens our people with annihilation. In past years, we've sent humanitarian aid around the world, Haiti, Philippines, Mexico, many other places where disaster struck. Closer to home, we've treated thousands of Syrians, Syrian civilians injured in the terrible war just beyond our border. And we do all this for one reason, We do it because it's the right thing to do. Too many times in my people's history, the world failed to act when it could. The world failed to do the right thing. So we have a special sensitivity to help those in need. And today, Israeli technology and medicine is saving lives around the world. We will continue to offer sympathy and support to victims, no matter where they're from, even if their regime and their governments don't care for them as much as they care to hate us. We care. This is Israel. Compassionate, caring, kind. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. You know, when we talk about home, the first association is to speak about family. And this home indeed has become family for the survivors. It all started in 2010. Shimon Shabak, who directs today this house, he had a small soup kitchen here in this neighborhood and he saw that Holocaust survivors were coming to his soup kitchen and he felt if there are needy Holocaust survivors, we need to do something about it. And he asked us to come and he showed us a small apartment where he wanted to host 13 Holocaust survivors. He said, can the Christian Embassy help us to purchase that building? I looked at the entire building, which was a four-store building. I felt the Lord talk to me and I said, Shimon, why don't we buy the entire house? driving away from Haifa and thought, oh my gosh, what did I do? And how do we ever get this money together? I was pleading with the Lord, please help us. We have five months time to get the money together. For me, the biggest miracle was to see within two weeks, people were sending us so much money like never before that after two weeks, we could purchase that building. And within those five months which we had, we could even purchase two buildings. אני רואה גם שיש פה יד אלוהים במקום הזה. וללא המחקם בין השגרות הנוצרית ליד עזר לחבר, המקום הזה לא יכל להתפתח. אז אני רואה בדצ... במדרגה ראשונה את הדבר הטוב ביותר שקורה, ולא סתם אה, באים לפה בני נוער, אה, חיילים, שהם שומעים שנוצרים, הם מחזיקים את המקום, הם מתנדבים במקום, זה מראה שאפשר גם את ההיסטוריה לשנות בצורה טובה, והשגרות הנוצרית היא דוגמה. לכל הנוצרים בעולם, איך אפשר לעשות דברים אחרת, ואתם עושים את זה גם ככה. ואני 
what I could see is that this house is providing an inner healing to those people to deal with their past in a, in a positive way. You know, as a German, to see this home, and it's very humbling in many ways. You come from a country which uh, wrote the darkest chapter of Jewish history, and today to be here and to see that you are able to open a new page in the life of the Jewish people, that's it's very touching. <laughs> people from all over the country, they are applying, we want to be at the home for Holocaust survivors. And the very sad story for me is that many of them we have to tell, no, we don't have the finances to add more people to it. So it's really my vision that by the end of this year, even we have a hundred people here, or that we can expand this house here in this next few years, uh, even for a couple of hundred survivors. Time is running out in Israel and we need your help to continue this operation here in Haifa and even to expand it. The keys are in your hand. Please help us to open the door and welcome them home. Are you a pastor or church leader looking for fresh vision for your ministry and a chance to see what God is doing in Israel? Join us in Jerusalem for the Envision Pastors and Leaders Conference. You will have the opportunity to connect with local Messianic and Arab pastors, receive exclusive briefings from key national leaders of the State of Israel, and enjoy special times of worship and prayer. To learn more about the annual Envision Pastors and Leaders Conference, visit envision.icej.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.